The Stephen Port case, a shocking example of police negligence. The police services are looked at with utmost respect all over the world because of their painstaking efforts to help us feel secure and save thousands of lives every day. But sometimes people get to see the inefficiency underneath the sense of duty, which is expected from police. Though today's case is apparently about a serial killer and his mechanics of killing, if you will stay with us till the end of the video, you will be able to see the sheer depiction of irresponsibility from the police who made the killer extend his deadly game for years. Welcome to AF Crime, the channel that brings you fascinating crimes all around the world. If you're interested in this kind of content, this channel is for you. Make sure to like this video, click on the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell to keep you updated on our recent uploads. Now, let's get right into the video and investigate more about the horrific case of Stephen Port, who is also known as the Grinder Killer. The man who outwardly seemed a very reserved and shy individual eventually turned out to be a serial killer and an occasional rapist. It was a fine morning on June 19, 2014, when the Metropolitan Police received a call from the Barking area of East London. The sergeant at duty presumed it to be another call reporting the drama of drunkards in the morning, as it was common in the pubs located near the area. Upon receiving it, he heard a man uttering in a slow and suspicious voice. He was saying that he had found a man unconscious in front of his apartment building as he was out for a walk. Now he doesn't know what to do with the man because he has never experienced such a thing. He further requested an ambulance or some medical services after giving the address of his place. The sergeant was quick to report with a medical team and as they arrived at the location, they found that the man was no longer there, but there was a young guy who was wearing his underwear inside out. He found that the guy was no longer passed out, but he had died long ago before their arrival. The police further inquired about the person who had made the call, and it was found that the caller was a man named Stephen Port, who lived in the apartment nearby. The body was taken for forensic testing and identification. The police found that the guy was 23 years old, and his name was Anthony Walking. The forensics revealed huge amounts of gamma hydroxybutyric acid, GHB, a type of rape drug in his bloodstream. They concluded that it was a case of simple drug overdose, which the guy might have taken to spend his night with someone. They didn't bother to check further credentials after that, and no DNA samples were collected from his clothes to approve any further suspicion. It seemed that they simply erased the case from their memory. Now let's move back to the month of August when Stephen was still free in 2014. This time, the Metropolitan Police Department received another dead body of a 22-year-old Slovakian national named Gabrielle Novaro. Now, the strange thing was that the police had recovered the dead body from the graveyard of St. Margaret's Church, which was located in the same barking area from where they had earlier received Stephen's call and Anthony's body. Yet, the police remained unsuccessful to connect the two deaths with each other, despite the fact that they found the same drug, GHB in his body too. They were unable to establish a strong connection. At this point, they simply considered it another case of overdose. Following his death, Gabrielle's boyfriend, who lived in Spain and was in a long distance relationship with Gabrielle, wanted to share some evidence with the police, but he was denied access. Let me reveal that piece of evidence to you. So, it turns out that Gabrielle was in a live-in relationship with Stephen and he had sent some images of him and Stephen at Stephen's place just the night before his death. Now, you can conclude well who was behind the murder, only if the police had been efficient enough to check on the evidence that Gabrielle's boyfriend wanted to share. Stephen's truth had been revealed to all sooner, yet Stephen got more time, and with time, his killing habit didn't end. Just three weeks after the death of Gabrielle, the police received another dead body from the exact same location. This time, it was a 21-year-old body named Daniel Whitworth. The police finally started getting suspicious to see the similarity in the pattern of the deaths of Gabrielle and Daniel. However, they found a suicide note near the dead body where it was written, don't blame the other guy who was with me the previous night. Now, the right step at this point should have been the investigation of the other guy. 
who was with Daniel, but the police totally ignored that. Furthermore, they were some bruises noticed on his body which the police declared harmless in the case. When Daniel's parents demanded to be shown the suicide note, they were initially denied and the case was closed. It seemed that the police didn't want to get their hands dirty or accept their failure in assessing the criminal behind the murder. Throughout the events of these three murders, not once the police had raised their suspicions on Stephen, for they believed that the death was a consequence of his own actions where a drug overdose was evident. In the meanwhile, Stephen was free to commit another murder within a period of 13 months. After Daniel's murder, during all this, not even once did the police suspect him to be a potential killer because of his connections. Though Stephen was arrested on the account of misinformation and perverting the court of justice in 2015, as Stephen had wrongly informed them that Walgate, the first dead guy, was merely passed out in front of his house when he was actually dead for a long time. He was sentenced to a period of eight months and was later on released in June after electronic tagging. Well, electronic tagging is a modern way to declare someone a convict. An electronic tag is tied to the foot of the convict and his actions are monitored throughout the period of his sentence. Following his release, he was already cooking up another murder plan in his mind. In September 2015, Stephen committed a fourth murder. This time, the victim was a 25-year-old guy named Jack Taylor. Following his proven way, Stephen had met the guy through the Grinder app and later on overdosed him. His body was recovered on the 14th of September 2015. Stephen was very clever. He had chosen a gap of 13 months consciously to make it slide from the memory of the police that the other three murders were also of the same nature. He knew that if the police established a close connection, they would get the truth out of him in no time. However, they subsequently failed to establish a suitable link between Taylor and the other three murders. For them, it was just another case of drug overdose, which was fine wrong. Like before, they informed Taylor's parents and tried to brush their hands of the case. What one can say is a clear chance of events. This time, there was someone who couldn't escape from the after effects of the killing. Those two people were Taylor's sisters, Donna and Jenny, who emerged as personal detectives for the case. When they asked the police about the available evidence, they simply ignored their call. So both the sisters dived in to find out the possible cause behind their brother's unfortunate death. They were sure of one thing, their brother was full of life and under any circumstances, he couldn't accept defeat by killing himself. So they started investigating the past suicides and killings which had occurred in the Barking locality. This was when they found that both Daniel and Gabrielle were exactly killed in the same pattern as that of their brother Taylor. The shocking thing was that the police had even considered their deaths as a case of a drug overdose. They started connecting the dots and found that something was really off with the way these deaths had happened in the same locality over the past year. They even shared their doubts with the Metropolitan Police, but they simply negated those claims. The sisters knew that things were not right and others were in danger, but couldn't do anything more than what they had already done. Right after 10 days of their investigation and submission of evidence, a police detective came across CCTV footage where he found Taylor walking with a strange looking man in a subway station. This was the first big piece of evidence and the surprising element was that this was exactly before the death of Taylor. He concluded that somehow this person was linked to the death of Taylor. After a thorough analysis, the guy who was walking with Taylor was recognized as no one else but Stephen Port. When some of the cops saw the picture, they remembered that they had investigated the guy a year ago for the murder of Walgate. Now things were becoming clear. In fact, they also traced Stephen's connection with Gabrielle, Daniel, and Taylor. When all those loose ends were finally tied back together, no doubts were left about the fact that Stephen was the man responsible for killing all four boys. On the 15th of October 2015, Stephen was finally arrested from his house. Though he pleaded innocent, investigations revealed that Stephen used to lure young men over the online dating app Grinder and then murdered them by giving them high doses of GHB. For this reason, the police called him the Grinder Killer. Of course, this case was quite simple. If only the police officers who were looking over the case earlier had probed deeply into this case. 
It was definitely a huge blunder on the police end. So an investigation was carried out against the 17 cops of the Metropolitan Police involved throughout the case. Disciplinary action was taken against them. And in 2022, the Metropolitan Police paid a penalty to the families of the affected ones as per the court orders. With Stephen, however, things worked quite differently. He started altering his statements, which made it hard for the police to understand the potential reasons behind the murder. In fact, to this day, he pleads innocent. He described that the murders were accidental or of a conspiratorial nature to defame him. But the evidence which was recovered from his house didn't explain so. When he was sentenced to lifelong imprisonment on the 16th of November 2015, he had resisted a lot, describing it as unfair decisions. He appealed again in 2018 for his conditional bail, but this was also immediately rejected. When the initially recovered suicide of Danielle's note was present in the court before parents, they both testified that it was not Daniel's writing and no doubt was left in the fact that it was Stephen who had planned to escape from the mass murders this way. Currently, the guy is passing his sentence and a fresh inquiry into the cases started in July 2020 to look at the prime factors motivating the reason for death. Well, it took an exceptionally long period of time for the police to find out the true culprit, and most of it is the fault of the Metropolitan Police, which asserts that there is no safety and security for the inhabitants. Someone has rightly said that crime exists because the criminal is overlooked by the law enforcement organizations. Only if the police were active enough to catch Steven on the first run, things would have been different and many lives could have been saved. Well, that's all from today's case. Tell us what you think about this in the comments. Also, if you feel that this case was an intriguing one, like this video and share it with all your friends. Also, subscribe to our AF Crime channel for finding more shocking tales around the world. And if you have any criminal case that you'd like me to investigate, share it in the comment section below.